Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. Don't forget you can follow the podcast on Facebook. It's always nice to share other people's news and views. It would be great to build a World War II community there. If you would like to show your support for the podcast, I have a Patreon page set up. There you can create a recurring monthly donation. The page is patreon.com forward slash WW2 podcast and you'll find a link on the website. In this episode, I'm joined by Mark Buner. Mark and I got into a Twitter conversation lamenting how history had seemed to overlook the British General Richard O'Connor. In lieu of that fact, we struggled to find an authority on O'Connor. We have taken it upon ourselves to try and recount his exploits and hopefully pique your interest in one of the war's greatest and yet overlooked commanders. O'Connor came very close to expelling the Italians out of North Africa. If things hadn't distracted the British drawing away his troops, there very well could have been no Africa Corps or El Alamein. Rommel and Monty would have had to make their names elsewhere. He was born in 1889 in Srinagar, India. His father was a major in the Royal Irish Fusiliers. Pensioned off due to an injury, the family had to return to Britain. Well-to-do, yet not necessarily well-off, though they did have enough money to send him to public school, and for our American friends that's actually private school, I know, it's confusing, before he entered the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst in 1908. He was commissioned into the second Scottish Rifles, the Cameroonians, the following year, and at the outbreak of war he was just 25. Shall we start with the First World War? Um, what do we know? Uh, absolutely. His, uh, I, I think he was very well thought of as a staff officer. Um, a lot of the work he did sort of pushed him towards more field commands. And uh, uh, his work in France was certainly spot on. Uh, but it was really in Italy that uh, his star began to rise, I think, through the, uh, through the ranks. That and actually just the ability to survive, because, I mean, he was in from the start in the First World War. He must be one of, oh, I say one of the few. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot, but he was there. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to see if I can see when he, he deploys to France in October 1914. So he's there for the whole, he, he did the whole of the First World War. So, so that in itself, and he, as you say, he, he saw a lot of action. But it's Italy where his star rises. And... Do you think it's worth looking at some of the minutia, or not minutia, the general scope of what he did in Italy? Because it strikes me, it, 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 there's these two attacks that, that that he did, which could be said, do you think, to be a, a, almost a microcosm of, of what is to come with the way he operates? I, I would say that, yeah, you could see the, the uh, formation of his... Uh, theory or his uh his uh vision as a general uh the use of combined arms the importance of surprise um the uh, certainly his experiences in france must have taught him the futility of headlong attacks and mm. the need to uh be able to exploit a breakthrough once it's achieved as opposed to just taking the ground that is in your immediate front but looking two three steps down the road i think that was definitely the the uh, beginnings of that uh, thought process. Yeah, I think you're right. And it's, as you say, it's a surprise. I mean, he launched two night attacks by boat, which was against doctrine at the time. And he launched them on the flanks, which, as you say, that he's learnt, you know, don't hit them head on. Don't just keep banging your head against the brick wall so much as they'd been doing in the Western Front. And, and you know, though to be fair, you know, flank attacks are vaguely difficult on a one long continuous front. But when he had the opportunity... He went for the flanks. So he comes out the First World War, as you say, very well. He's very well thought of. And he's into war period again. I think, although I could be wrong, he, he ends up uh, one of the youngest generals in the British Army. But there's some, also some formative associations he makes during the interwar years. And I think one of which is at some point he's attached to Fuller, J.C. Fuller, Boney Fuller, the, the tank theorist who there's a lot of talk about Fuller and uh, Little Hart you know, influencing Guderian. So how much, how much do you know about Fuller's ideas and, and his experimental tank brigade? Because if we brief over them, that might give us some indication of what's going on for later down the line. It, it's controversial to this day. <laughs> it's, to say the least, it's, it's controversial. The ideas of Fuller and Little Hart 
have its champions and have its detractors. And the fascinating thing about O'Connor was he was right in the middle of this. He was assigned to the experimental brigade in the early 20s. Obviously, the British invented the tank and they were trying to figure out what do we do with this? Is this something that is going to complement the infantry or is it going to be something completely novel? And uh, Fuller and Littlehart had definite ideas that this was not just some sort of uh, moving pillbox that was uh, wonderful to complement your infantry. It was something revolutionary that, that, that just changed the way warfare is conducted from top to bottom. They sort of envisaged swathes of them charging across the countryside, but almost overlooking what the, you know, believing the infantry was not necessarily as important then as the tank. Right. And Fuller, uh, of the two, Fuller definitely envisioned even all tank armies up, up very up to the actual army and which was aside being horrifically expensive and impossible <laughs> was just didn't didn't uh give proper consideration to all the other things that infantry provides crossing rivers and in yeah. uh and the vulnerability of the tank to infantry to artillery to anti-tank weapons that was definitely the weakness of the the that school of thought uh, I think Little Heart was much more open to the combined arms, which was really what the experimental brigade was uh, developed into. And what O'Connor was, he was a staff officer during that development of figuring out how these combined arms can work, how the Air Force can, can interact. He also gets sent to the Middle East at some point uh, he's in Palestine. He's major general in Palestine and told to put down the Arab revolt. And I thought this was interesting as well, because, again, it shows independence of thought when the army won't go into the streets because they're going to be attacked by all from all sides and there's not much he can do he orders the men to stand on the roofs because that you know, prevents them coming out from all sides and i thought that was um again it's one of those it shows independence of thought it shows thinking different to what everybody else had come before him uh had done and i think it's important to sort of look at I mean, he he thought he had an ability to think differently. It was another example of O'Connor finding himself in a situation where he had to make these decisions without really any input or oversight. And he basically had he had the ball and he could he had the freedom to do what he thought would work. And it often did work. Uh, I think his his work in the Middle East was probably underrated in, in the sense that he brought some order and stability to that region that obviously even to this day is not easily uh, found. It was a very difficult situation. The British continually struggled with it. And at the outbreak of war, so Percy Hobart, um, who uh, was another acolyte to the tank uh, movement, Hold that become famous later in the war for his funnies on D Day tanks with the the, the um, flail tanks and whatnot, and he's relieved from command uh, by Wavell. Um, I think Paul Bout was probably a difficult man to get on with. Right. So O'Connor reaches the desert. What's the situation in the desert in uh, 1940? A grim, <laughs> I suppose, is the simplest description. So O'Connor shows up. This is. The Battle of Britain is raging. France has surrendered. The Italians are in the war. And essentially, O'Connor is staring across the desert at 250,000 Italians ready to come and seize the Suez Canal, the Middle Eastern oil fields. It's uh, not a good situation. O'Connor had 25,000 men, maybe. Uh, some advantages. He, he had probably the best British division to that date, Hobart, uh, created a crack, crack division. There was no question about that. It was very, very used to the desert, ready to maneuver. Um, he, he had that, uh, but the, the numbers were staggering against, against him. This Middle East command, uh, with Wavell in charge, was a, was a big command. It covered, uh, well, it would end up covering Greece. It covered North Africa and you know, Ethiopia, Somalia. And, and at the same time, it was key because British oil came from Iraq uh, the Arabs were saber rattling there, so they needed troops to keep that down. If the British lost the Suez Canal, that's the route to India cut off, or a route to India cut off uh, for supplying 
um, well, for what would be supplying ultimately uh, war against Japan. But I guess at this time, for, uh, supplies are coming in the opposite direction from India because it would be a safe a safe haven for producing things. So it was a, it was a key command, and as you say, they were vastly outnumbered against Mussolini and who had his um, idea that he was going to have North Africa. So what was their initial move? It's interesting because given the disparity in numbers, and as you say, Wivel had tremendous responsibilities in a huge geographical region, and uh, their first instinct was to attack. <laughs> we, we we can't wait for the Italians to just grind us back against the canal. Our best hope is to go out against them and use our uh, the the advantage in tanks for the British over the Italian versions was st- substantial, and they knew that that would be something that they needed to exploit as best they can through a a battle of maneuver as opposed to any sort of uh, static battle. But when the Italians came, they obviously came in force and the British quietly withdrew but then the Italians surprisingly stopped right but it's overwhelming force they they come in I think it's 59 miles uh and stop the, the British were active in, in that period they, they were pulling back but they were also eager to sting the Italians as they approached whenever they could and probably give them a bit of a bloody nose that they maybe weren't expecting um the Italians in perhaps typical Roman fashion, we're going to rely on their engineering and their their artillery was actually substantial and, and well-served. So those were their what they thought their advantages were. So they were going to build a road and a water pipeline all the way back to Tripoli, essentially, build up their supplies, reserves, and move at their, at their leisure. They assumedly were assuming the British were fairly on the ropes at this point, and they had all the time in the world, which... <laughs> Many examples in history will show is, is a, a dangerous thought to have. Yeah, and they stopped, and they 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 stopped essentially waiting for the pipeline for the water to bring them forward and they build up supplies. And they build five fortified camps. Now, this time they're hugging. Everyone's hugging the, the coast because it's it's easy to maneuver up and down. And predominantly in the in North Africa, it, all all this is backwards and forwards in, along the. the the coast and not too deep in land. Right. And they built five forty-five camps. And Wavell and Co- O'Connor decided to go on the offensive. Right. And uh, I think O'Connor was possibly disappointed at that moment because he was expecting the Italians to continue uh, their drive. And he had a rather elaborate trap set up that might have moved up the, the timetable of uh, what ultimately happened. And as we'll see, the, uh, the timing on, of all of this is crucial. Uh, the clock was ticking, and O'Connor certainly knew it. There were so many demands for British firepower all over the geographical area that yeah. this, was, uh, this had to be done. It was envisioned as a raid, a five-day, I, I think it was, raid to sting the Italians and give them a, another bloody nose and potentially push them back some, but... I don't know that anyone expected the level of success, uh, except perhaps O'Connor in his own mind. I have a quote here from Wavell saying, I do not entertain extravagant hopes for this operation, but I do wish to make it certain that if big opportunities occur, we are prepared morally, mentally and administratively to the fullest. And boy, did they get the fullest. But um, even there, and he's stating before it starts that you know he doesn't have extravagant hopes. And this will be, this will be Operation Compass. And, and uh, that, uh, it's a tribute to Wavell and uh, the, the, the British command in that it, there was a unwieldy uh, chain of command uh, at the time. You know, Connor certainly was there and, you know, he had a lot of masters to serve. But that being said, they all seemed to work in, in great harmony. They all had they were on the same page. They, they were going to attack. And if the opportunity arose, they were going to be prepared to exploit it. The plan was initially to he he created forward supply dumps. The big problem for everybody in the desert was always going to be supplies and supply lines, right? Uh, because ultimately, you know, the, the further you go, the more trucks you need. So the, later in the war, the German high command calculated uh, this was a staggering figure. This this sort of shows you how once your supply lines get long, how stuffed you are. Rommel's motorized divisions needed three hundred and fifty tons of supplies a day. To supply them over 300 miles, they'd need 39 columns of 32-ton trucks. That's 1,100 
and 70 trucks. But 35% of trucks would always be in repair. This is without the organic trucks for moving troops, it's just supply trucks. So to supply Rommel's later in the war supplies three divisions, he'd need 5,000 trucks. Now, it's it's a staggering amount of su- supplies are needed of petrol, and right. obviously the more trucks you have, the more petrol you need just to move supplies. So O'Connor's big idea, which which would be used further on in the war, used again, was this idea of uh, creating forward supply dumps. O- O'Connor's mastery of logistics was maybe his greatest attribute. He, it, the the wonders they were working here of getting these supplies up, hiding them in the desert, very, very close to the Italians, uh, within miles, and they're doing this all secretly. And the British control of the air was not nearly what it was later in the war over North Africa. It had to be done in secret. It had to be done quickly. All of this, uh, it had to go off all together at the same time. And just aside from getting people where they're supposed to be, you know, communications weren't what they were it, it was uh, it, really an astonishing feat just the logistics it was it it was absolutely remarkable so the plan was once he's got these um forward supply dumps is to knock the camps out in detail isn't it perhaps not in the most expected way um uh, o'connor initially I, I think his plan was a, a bit more straightforward to rush these camps rather head on they, the, the british should have an advantage in uh their infantry tanks were, were excellent, and uh, the, the Italians really didn't have an answer for them. So he gave that a little bit of thought, and it ended up that what he, what he ended up doing was bypassing the camps and attacking them from the rear, which worked extremely well. Of course, the Italians were taken completely by surprise. It helped that the, supply, the Italians had actually managed to put their camps so far apart they weren't self-supporting, so it, it did allow a bit of leeway for the British to slip through. Absolutely, and that was a, you know, obviously a major tactical blunder that O'Connor was quick to exploit. Uh, quickly overran the camps, a combination of infantry attacking from the front and the armor attacking from the rear, which is obviously devastating. But that was to become, I think, something of O'Connor's modus operandi was to fix the enemy in one direction and attack them from an unexpected direction. Not a novel approach in warfare, but to actually execute it is another thing. So this is on the 9th of December it goes in. Now, interestingly, as a portent of things to come, I mean, I know Wavell says he's uh, ready to execute uh, to the fullest. I was going through uh, Allenbrook, uh, who was this time the chief of imperial staff, uh, general staff. Um, He says in his diary... Impending withdrawals in reference to the Middle East. So Allenbrook, a day after all this is going in, is already thinking about moving people out. Now, we'll come to this later, but I think that's it shows that there is bigger movements now afoot than what what is going on in the desert. Right, and this is probably where the grand strategy of uh, the British war to this point comes into play. Italy had invaded Greece, and that caused a problem for the British in that it opened a new front, essentially. Churchill was extremely interested in, in getting back on the continent in some, in any magic, wherever it could be, he wanted to get back into Europe. And uh, it, right away, he was it, the thought was to send some relief to, to help the Greeks stand up against the Italians. Um, so that, in a sense, set the clock ticking. It was pretty well thought that at some point there were, some relief was going to be sent, and they could really only be sent from O'Connor's force. That was just all that was available at the time. And, and I'm not sure that Connor was quite as fully aware of that as he might otherwise have been. I mean, it's not necessarily in his direct battlefield sort of space. True, true. Yeah. But certainly above him, Wavell, who who is the man being asked for troops, is aware of this. The British knock out the forts and the Italian army goes into flight. Full retreat back across the desert. And as we said, there's really a thin lane uh, against the ocean that is uh, where the road is, such as it was. uh, And they were going to fall back towards their supplies, towards their defences. They're already uh, surrendering in droves. By the 12th of December, they've uh, lost. And that's obviously um, prisoners of war wounded and killed over 38,000 men now you know that's 
considering the British had available, you know, some 30,000 troops, it's not bad going. By That was the 12th of December. By January, there's another 25,000 captured, 5th of January. For the rest of December and January, the Italians are just reeling backwards. Um, January 27th, there's another 15,000 surrender. They are surrendering in droves. The Italians will dig in somewhere and O'Connor will hit them in front with his infantry division and the seventh armor will work around the flank this this happens again and again and that's the the, the number of captured is, is is going up and up here all of a sudden you have streams of italian prisoners going backwards while you're trying to bring supplies forward it, again we're, we're looking at just the sheer ability to move people and supplies is, is becoming a, a major issue and one big factor in o'connor's favor is this western desert force that hobart had been uh, when hobart got hold of it it didn't do a lot of desert it was afraid of the desert one of the big things hobart driv- drilled into them was not to fear the desert to go into the desert and this fell very well with o'connor when he had to do these flanking attacks his troops who were desert veterans they'd been there for you know a, a long period of time and they weren't afraid to drive into the desert to put these hook movements in to catch the Italians out. It really worked very well for him, that force that he had. He was definitely well served by Hobart's contribution. And just their ability to, to keep their tanks and their trucks running was impressive. Obviously, the, the sand and the salt and all these things working against uh, the internal combustion engine is a major issue in any kind of desert warfare. So we have the final nail in the coffin, uh, You know, the master stroke at... Uh, Bit of foam. Well, at this point, and something else to consider is the Indian division of infantry that had been fighting all these battles had been withdrawn at this point. So uh, they'd been replaced by an Australian division. So during all of this, this movement and fighting, and it, they're actually swapping out the two infantry divisions, which is another logistical nightmare for O'Connor to deal with. Not only that, the Indians are used to the Western Desert Force. The Australians were new to the area and they right. had to then get into the swing of things as you said uh, you know right. new, new commander uh new officers to deal with uh, they, they performed brilliantly as the uh indians had and uh so the australians were pressing down down the coast push basically pushing the italians in front of them who were in just in full flight now uh they would occasionally you know make a stand somewhere but really just to provide some some space so they can you know they're they're in full flight back to libya and this is the point where I would argue the brilliance of this campaign really comes into play. Uh, the obvious thing would be just to keep pushing them back. And that was sort of probably the initial thought by Wavell was, OK, we've, we've accomplished what we've accomplished where no one can say that you haven't had great success. But O'Connor thought a little bit bigger and his idea was to get in front of the Italians and to do that required cutting completely across the desert in the uncharted, unknown territory uh, with whatever mobile units he could, pushing them in front and stopping the Italians long enough to bag them in the open. Mm. And it's it's a hell of a move. So his, his force was in place in front of the Italian retreat as the Italians walked down the road. And, uh, and by force, at this point, after crossing that, that, that part of really true uh, desolation, there wasn't much that got there to cut the Italians off. We're, we're talking about a, a force of basically armored cars and uh, machine gunners in, in small numbers. Uh, the shock must have been tremendous when they're in full flight and perhaps they see a light at the end of the tunnel and here are the British dug in across the only road, their only escape. So by the 7th of February, at the end of that, the British have bagged 133,000 Italians. 420 tanks, 845 guns. I mean, it is staggering for such a small force to capture so many. Never more than 36,000 British troops of all arms, and they've bagged an, an entire Italian army. Rarely in the war, outside of perhaps the Russian front, were entire armies captured. Uh, O'Connor's message back to Wavell, I, I think, was always brilliant. It, it, it was... Fox killed in the open. <laughs> and uh, uh, elsewhere in the war, uh, a fox was never killed in the open, not by, not, by the, uh, not by the British, not by the Americans, if I could think. Anthony Eden amusingly put it 
uh, as a play on uh, one of Churchill's speech, never has so much been surrendered by so many to so few. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great turn of a phrase. <laughs> <laughs> the 7th of February, um, there's nothing, there's nothing. The Italian army in North Africa has ceased to exist. They have 500 miles between them and Tripoli. To take Tripoli knocks out the Italians out of North Africa. But on the 9th of Feb, I mean, I presume there's some sort of mopping up uh, on the 8th. The 9th of Feb, Churchill orders an halt as the situation in Greece is uh, deteriorating and troops are withdrawn to Greece. Right. The, the Italians have failed miserably in Greece and to the point where the Germans have come down to join the, the, the party. And uh, the Greek prime minister has died and been replaced. And now they are asking for the British to intervene. And that is what brings a halt to this operation. Uh, O'Connor is looking across all of North Africa is in his palm. And uh, all he has to do is advance and take Tripoli. And the, the war has taken a very different turn than it did historically but the the word came down no you're we're going to leave a, a covering force here the italians are done and we're going to send these veteran troops that have performed so well and we're going to put them on ships and send them to greece which was a fiasco of its own that <laughs> yeah I and mean, that's a whole another story of a disaster i mean in this instance hindsight is crushingly wonderful you would you, you could have changed the course of the war with hindsight, but at this stage, it, it's almost from now on in is reinforcing failure. Which uh, there's the Churchill quote, isn't there? About um, we almost never won a battle before Alamein, and after Alamein, we never lost one. And what people forget is the almost. In this instance, the almost is O'Connor and Operation Compass. Um, before that, we have um, France was a disaster. After Compass, we have Greece and then all the run through to Alamein, which is you know, problematic. But could things have been different? Could they have pushed through to Tripoli? Is it a missed opportunity? I think there's no question. O'Connor himself, uh, later in life, says that he debated whether to disobey orders and just to push through with whatever was available. Obviously, his, uh, his force, after you know, fighting for two months across the desert, was really uh, in, in poor shape as far as transportation, but he was very willing to push forward and he, uh, there were no doubts in his mind. And I, I think the Germans and Italians that were left, and, and by the way, Rommel showed up on the continent February 13th. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, if, if nothing else, we might've been robbed of that interesting uh, encounter. They started landing on the 10th, uh, the Africa Corps. So uh, Churchill orders you stop on the 9th and they, the, the first units were on the 10th. So it would have been a race against time. Obviously, they did. They took quite a while to get there in any any strength, but you know, that might have been something. It undoubtedly was a missed opportunity, but how realistic uh, was it? Because I, th I, I think that militaristically, it seems like a no-brainer to push through. I do think... As you say, you said his men were worn out. I think logistically he could have well got into the same problem Rommel would have in reverse. You know, just push too far and you cannot, over those huge distances, uh, support your people. So if somebody had scraped something together to give them a bit of a backbone to steady them up, the Italians up, it, uh, it could have slowed things down and O'Connor could have just been in the same but that Rommel often was where he struggled with his logistics. But I think militarily, militarily tactically, it seems like a strange idea. But I think uh, when you go back and look from Wavell's point of view, I have a feeling that there was no alternative. So my, I, I have a feeling that because Churchill had committed to Greece, we had to do something. They were the only people to send. So that, so that, those had already had to go. There's the other problem that his force had already been drained. As you said, the Indians uh, had had to go uh, and they were pre-booked on a con on a uh, ships coming through Suez. And if they didn't get on those ships, there wasn't going to be a convoy to take them to Ethiopia and Somaliland for a while. So 
So they had to be withdrawn, which would have been better if they'd have been left with the Australians, but they had to go because the Italians were facing off in uh, Ethiopia and Somaliland. So that draws people further away. So I, I just think that Wavell was very conscious of he was getting incredibly thin on the ground, almost without any choice. He has to send some people uh, south in Africa and he politically, his political masters are demanding that he sends troops to Greece. I mean, and I just have this feeling that if they'd pushed on, they might have got into a really sticky situation. That, that's certainly uh, very valid. If O'Connor could have bloodlessly taken Tripoli, that would have been one thing. But yeah, if the, if the Italians had put up any kind of a stand, he would have been in, in, in trouble very quickly, especially with the Germans showing up in force. That was, if they could have held out even a few weeks, O'Connor would have found himself in, in serious trouble. There were too many critical situations that needed to be addressed. And it's it's not surprising that this happened. It's just given the next year plus of desert warfare and the, the drama involved and the, the casualties involved, is that that's really what makes it difficult to, to take lying down it mainly uh that that could have been avoided that uh north africa could have been secured that much quicker and we wouldn't have gone through the succession of commanders and all in uh, uh, the loss of life that it entailed R- rommel certainly thought the british were overcautious and he claims he would have pushed through irrespective i mean i, I think it's no poor reflection <laughs> no poor reflection on connor because uh, what he'd done was phenomenal and from this point wavell now withdraws him to Cairo for a rest. Um, he'd been on the go and they put in Neem in charge. And it, the situation now is role reversal as the Africa Corps all arrives. And uh, O'Connor is uh, just worn out after a, uh, this, you know, many, many sleepless nights, I would imagine, was in, in poor health at this point. And they really, there was no thought that the, the front would heat up again, certainly not so quickly. So just a, a scattering uh, covering force was, was left in place. And Rommel took advantage of that very quickly, uh, surprising Neem uh, and creating uh, an instant crisis that uh, had to be addressed. It's interesting that, you know, this victorious British force suddenly struggled when it met the Germans. Seemingly both were mechanised. They were both modern forces. Um, we're not looking at, you know, the Italians were very infantry orientated just to make up their tricks. They were both modern armoured forces. So why do you think the British struggled? I, I think the immediate answer was circumstantial. It was they, they had fought this, this battle that, you know, lasted a couple of months and they were marching and they were, they were worn, worn out. Uh, there was no question. And they were not put in particularly good defensive postures to meet this. It, the level of surprise probably can't be understated. And I'm, I'm sure their morale must have been extremely high to begin with. They knew they, on a, on a fair fight, I, I think they would be uh, very game for it. But Rommel caught them at, at a bad time. And I'm sure it was uh, quite a shock to the system. I, I think the British armoured was very game for it uh, up until it kept getting a bloody nose. So I, I, I think they learned a lot from, um, you know, the Germans were, had closer combined arms and they used their anti-tank guns offensively and defensively, uh, whereas the British tankers are often criticised in the desert for this idea that they just charge and they're not always about to support the infantry. The infantry often have to walk further than is anticipated because their you know, lorried infantry get dropped off and they have to walk for miles to get to the front. There is time after time, again, certainly against the Africa, there's this idea that the, the British just charge in and the Germans sit there behind their screen of anti-tank guns, take them all out and then push forward again. Leaving the infantry without any armoured support. <laughs> yeah. and, and this definitely harkens back to the controversies with Fuller and Littlehart and, and sort of the... There was definitely this belief that a, an all-tank, at least, arm of your army would be used as sort of the knockout blow while your infantry goes about the mundane tasks that infantry do. And the Germans didn't buy into that so much. They were very uh, keen to, to keep their arms combined, to keep artillery in the mix, to have infantry in close support 
so that that certainly hurt the British force at, at, at this point in the war, and it was it, it took quite a while to to get that out of the system. I think that the next six months or a year in the desert would see this again and again. Yeah, it, it would. And if you when you read um, Achtung Panzer, Guderian is very much talking about combined arms. He's, you know, he's, he's using his air support as mobile artillery to put uh, offensive behind the enemy lines it, it's a very much more all, all encompassing idea than necessarily the british uh, uh fuller's idea this is true and that, i think that was the limitation of fuller little heart had a different take and i think the difference here was little heart believed in an exploitation force that might be ideally it could be mechanized you knew that you could bring infantry along with you and artillery along with you but that being just the, the technology didn't so much exist, and certainly the money wasn't there for it. You have tanks. If you've blown a hole in the, en- in the enemy's front and you're into his rear, that exploitation force, and the Germans did that, that in the Battle of France, that Rommel was pushing to the coast with essentially all tanks at that point, and they started out as a combined armed force, but w- the exploitation was really the key. And, and that was what O'Connor did in, in Operation Compass, Con- uh, consciously or not, that's how it ended up. Yeah, I mean, and I don't, and I don't think that you know, there's anything to take away from com- Operation Compass because you know they were so vastly outnumbered. But it's interesting how two much more equally matched forces and 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 the British this triumphal British usually triumphal. What a you know, I was trying to find newspaper reports at the time and annoyingly <laughs> I couldn't pull any out of the bag. Uh, but he was he was the shining light on the war for the British at such a dire time. Yet suddenly we're thrown in the back, back foot and Wavell, Wavell flies back and asks him to uh, go and have a look. And that's, well, for the British Army, one of those wonderful what-ifs. Within two days, he's captured. What happens when he goes to see Neem? When, when he goes to see Neem? Probably one of the more awkward conversations. Uh, <laughs> Neem was a friend and uh, O'Connor being called in sort of to, to save his bacon uh, probably was... Uh, not the happiest moment for either of them, but the the situation certainly had to be retrieved, and the immediate thought was O'Connor was the man to do it, of course. So he was rushed forward. To his credit, refused to take command immediately. Didn't know the ground. He didn't know uh, the situation. So he spent a couple of days, sort of as an observer, to try to get a, a grasp of things, get his arms around it. And O'Connor was definitely a man to uh, go out and see with his own eyes. Uh, like Gutierrez was the same way at, at Rommel, I would say. They want to be as close to the front as they can to see. And um, unfortunately, uh, O'Connor and Neem at that point were ran into a German-Italian patrol and were captured. And what what is even more ironic is they were captured behind their own lines. It was a German reconnaissance patrol deep in, in, inside the British lines. I mean, they got lost, which I think was Neem's fault, wasn't it? Yeah, I think uh, Neem thought he knew uh, a shortcut of some sort, and uh, it certainly did not turn out well for him. But uh, Neem, I think, blamed himself deeply for that, and uh, they were close friends, and I think he felt the weight of that uh, for the rest of his life. Thankfully, possibly for O'Connor, they, he's imprisoned, he spends his prison as a prisoner of war in Italy. And the most incredible soldier of the war, Adrian Carton de Wirt. Uh, writes to O'Connor's wife that he's you know frightfully depressed. Uh, and a month later, he says oh, he's, he's he's picked up a bit. Um, I, I I don't think there's much to read to be said. They, they made a number of, of escape attempts, which he did get out, and they he got, he gets very close to the border. They're recaptured. Um, his biographer quotes Slim, uh, General Slim, one of the more outstanding British commanders of the war. He wrote this after uh, the defeats, the early de- defeats, in a dark hour about a commander. In a dark hour, he will turn on himself and question the very foundation of his leadership and manhood. And then he must stop, for if he is ever to command in battle again, he must shake off these regrets and stamp them. As they claw at his will and self-confidence, he must beat them off, these attacks he delivers against himself and cast out the doubts born of failure. So, how much do we think O'Connor stewed? I mean, he had a lot of time to think on the desert campaign. It wasn't so much the the bloody nose that Rommel had given him in the capture as the missed opportunity. Uh, I, I think no one was more aware of the the possibilities open to him at that moment, having just you know bagged the Italian army in Tripoli in front of him and being captured. I I, I think my best guess would be his thoughts were I, I'm missing out on this. Uh, 
opportunity. <laughs> I've trained my entire life for this moment and through just misfortune, here I am. As opposed to being, he was not defeated in the field. He was never in command of that force. So I think it was disappointment as much as anything. That's true. He did write a report. He did write his uh, his account of the desert at the time, which which made me which which read that when I read he'd write wrote his account, I I thought to myself, I wonder if he had been stewing on it, and if there is an argument, to say it might have affected in some way later down the line. People do say that he was. He performed differently after that. Now, I'm I'm not completely convinced of that argument, but I read that quote and I thought, well, I can understand why if somebody came out of captivity, he was in captivity two and a half years. And rather than actually managing to escape, the Italians surrendered. They were sort of pushed out of the camp by the commandant before the Germans could come and round them up. Right. Uh, and, and, and then they made their uh, escape. So it's kind of, they were allowed to escape by the Italians. And they fa- he finds way, their way back. He's very quickly given another command. It would make a movie that no one would believe, I suppose. But he did manage to slip back through it, to the Allied lines. Uh, at this point, the, the war was in Italy was in, in full swing. And yeah, he, his reputation was, uh, was intact. And uh, I, I think this might be a good time to talk about his relationship with Montgomery, which was a, a very close friendship, but a very, they had the, the similarities between the two of them were intense. Uh, we talked a little bit about the backgrounds and Montgomery came with a, a similar upbringing, a similar uh, path through, through, through the military. I, they, I think they had a lot of common and uh, Montgomery didn't, re- Montgomery didn't necessarily respect a lot of his contemporaries, but O'Connor uh, get an intense respect for O'Connor. There's an oddity that when Montgomery arrives in the desert, he he kind of states that everything that came before him was a failure. Uh, I mean, I have a th- I I think Montgomery was probably a pompous ass. I'm not sure how much he he could really th- think on his face. I'm I'm very I struggle with Montgomery. He he, he he's quick out with his his uh, biography after the war, uh, which kind of is always helpful. And he painted things how he wanted to be painted them. I, later on, I, I, I made a note that, uh, you know, Montgomery didn't lose battles. He just keep, kept adjusting what the uh, what the objective was. So whatever the outcome was, he could say that was his objective all along, which is very, very true in Normandy. Um, so he, but he did tar everything that came before him. And, and when O'Connell was in prison, his good friend George Collingwood actually complained to Wavell about Montgomery's remarks. So I thought I thought that it's interesting that even at the time it it looked like he was having a jab at what came before him, of which uh, Wavell backed up everything that uh, his opinion had, you know, that uh, O'Connor had, had nothing to worry about his re- remarks and uh, reassured him that Montgomery was not tiring O'Connor with that brush, but from those years of disaster. Uh, but they are very similar and it's funny how they're... How they're um, Paths had crossed. I think they crossed earlier. I think they'd been at some of the staff colleges and things together, hadn't they? They were. They they'd been friends, uh, yeah, since uh, definitely in the inner warriors. And then uh, they were together in Palestine again. Uh, I think each had essentially half of the province. <laughs> That's true. And Montgomery, I believe, uh, took on some of at that time uh, O'Connor's ideas. And uh, they were personally very close. I think they were both men, little slight in height and stature and that maybe had a certain chip on their shoulders that they were always looking to overcome i i won't go out a bag of chips in his shoulders <laughs> uh, but it is i don't know it's the time it is very quickly that out of captivity he's given a command and i think the only man to give anybody that command would be alan brooke and alan brooke uh had a meeting with him and decided he was fit but we are just talking uh, September, he's released, and January, he assumes command. So he really doesn't, by the time he gets back you know, via the Middle East, uh, he doesn't have long before he assumes command of Eighth Corps. And the, move, the, war had moved, the war had moved on, the technology had moved on, uh, and the tactics had moved on. Uh, and he goes over. He had a lot of catching up. Uh, a lot of catching up to do. They go over in Normandy, 
I don't think they, they took. I think they went over just after D Day. Right. I, I'd say the Eighth Corps was sort of the complement to Patton's Third Corps, in that it was the, the reserve tank heavy corps that was really sent over for exploitation of the imagined breakout. This is uh, where Montgomery's grand plan was to take Con on, on, I think, within the first sort of 24 hours, and it just becomes a slogging match. And we have a series of operations that Eighth Corps, you know, Epsom, Goodwood, Blue Coat, are just difficult slogging matches. Now, I want to say, why do you think O'Connor did so badly? I'm not sure that's the question. I mean, why did you think they went badly and how well do you think O'Connor did? I think the expectations for O'Connor were very high. Uh, his reputation preceded him and it made in that, that perfect sense that he should be given this sort of exploitation role to get into the open country and that did not end up happening and largely because he was never had the opportunity was you know Khan was not taken the Germans were heavily dug in and this, this slogging match happened and the Germans focused their armor on the on the British end of end of the line there was no question about it they the, the hardest fighting was happening around Khan that provided an opportunity for the Americans but in, from O'Connor's point of view he was throwing his armor against these well dug in Germans it's just not it was not his decision to do that it was just the, the circumstances demanded it. And uh, again, he'd, he'd been out of the war for two and a half years. He had a lot to learn about, especially the anti-tank, uh, the guns and their, their utility. So he had to learn very quickly. Uh, I'd put it this way. He didn't do worse than anyone else <laughs> in Normandy. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think that's a very valid point. He, di- he didn't do any worse than anyone else. And you're right. They, I think it was probably they were hoping there'd be a big breakthrough and he'd be leading the charge. But actually what happens is... Uh, and, and and that Colm becomes sort of an anvil that the Germans sort of smash themselves against repeatedly. I'd, I'm not sure how you measure success in that. Pip, the, the, Pip Roberts, uh, the British armour general wonder boy, says, you know, at, at, well, at least we were tying down huge amounts of German armour so the, the Americans could uh, uh, break out further south. Uh, which is not a bad point, but I, I, I suspect that was, wasn't was necessarily the end intended it. All, all these were, were actually, they were trying to break out, but actually they were just tying the Germans down and sucking in more German armour. Right, and, and regardless of the post-war uh, justification, I don't think that was ever the intent. Uh, <laughs> no, I've, I think that as well. And there's a lot of people seem to... There's a lot being written about how it was Bonte's grand plan to sit there and, and, and just batter away and the Americans would do this big hook. And I think that was more of an organic strategy that happened at the time. And he kept, as, it, as I said, he kept changing his objectives. Well, I, I do think that Montgomery took on the more difficult project to begin with. I, I think that's true. And that's to his credit that he thought the critical point was going to be Khan and he wanted his army on top of that. I don't think he, he expected it to turn into the slog fest it did. I just don't accept that. <laughs> no, I, I agree. But O'Connor doesn't really come out of it very well. No, and um, it's unfortunate because he got better with every battle. And in, in fact, uh, by, by the time we get to Operation Blue Coat, the Americans are breaking out. Patton is sort of tearing up the French countryside. And O'Connor just delivers this body blow to, to the middle of the German line that really helped set up the... Uh, Filet capture or, or the, the, the filet gap. funnel of destruction, if you will. And uh, O'Connor's part in that is it's another forgotten, you know, we come back to this is his great greatest victories seem to be not discussed as much as they might be, but he definitely had a, a major contribution to that. He's ordered to halt in that one again, though, isn't he? Uh, he is. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. We're back to this. As his troops are drawn off for elsewhere. Right. He perhaps had the opportunity to close off the, the valley gap completely and, again, bag an entire uh, Axis army. And uh, because of the, the lines between commands and whatever different justifications there are, he was sort of pulled back and his corps rather fell backwards in, into the line and was no longer in the front line. And as this exploitation that his corps was earmarked for starts to happen and they're not participating, I, Imagine that was another bitter blow. Yeah, and he he he, he loses. That's losing men to Horrocks, Brian Horrocks, uh, General Horrocks, right? Who, uh, Montgomery's favorite 
uh, who who becomes the rising star. And 30 Core would lead the charge at uh, Operation Market Garden, Bridge Too Far. And uh, O'Connor would be left to follow up and try and widen the uh, the assault line that, that, that they're making. Yeah, and he did, he did good work. And no one, there was no uh, criticisms of uh, the, you know, granted smaller battles that were happening uh, with Eighth Corps at that point, but they were they were well done, professionally done. Yeah, in a in a prob- problematic operation from the start. I mean, that was a again for everybody involved another uh, slogging match. He's not technically relieved. <laughs> he's he's promoted to India, which moves him out of the theatre and out of a field command. According to his biographer, the only man that could make that decision would be Alan Brooke, the. Uh, Sigs in London, but Monty never put up any effort to keep him. It is seems inconceivable that without Monty's acquiescence, that that could happen. I think O'Connor and Monty they uh, they were friends, they were close, intimate maybe. Uh, but they also ran into some serious issues uh, during this campaign. O- O'Connor is quite a prickly sort uh, as far as his. Uh, honor is concerned i think he was old-fashioned in that way if you know if you will uh montgomery was not that sort he was didn't, <laughs> didn't like to be defied and there, there was a situation where one of the uh, uh divisions under o'connor's command uh montgomery it was an american division montgomery did not like the uh, general in charge henry Lin- Lindsay sylvester right uh o'connor thought well of him montgomery for whatever reason <laughs> absolutely did not and uh, Montgomery wanted him replaced, and O'Connor refused. And I, O'Connor was very concerned that he thought he would be perceived as, as stabbing, stabbing him in the back, which was certainly not the case. So that created uh, offers of resignation and, and the, the full gamut of uh, bad feelings. Which, to be fair to Monty, you probably don't want your field commanders to be saying, you know, just Absolutely. throwing the toys out and saying, look, if you've got a bigger fish to fry than have to deal with a stroppy field commander. On the other side, O'Connor's one of his objections was it would hurt Anglo-American relationships, which w- were never great with Monty anyway. No, and, and it was his commander. It, 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 I would imagine he had felt that it was meddling in his command. Though, again, Pip Roberts, he believed you know, O'Connor was straight and honourable, but he didn't believe Sylvester was that good a general to resign for. And he felt that you know Sylvester was a nice guy and that kind of clouded O'Connor's judgment. It, it seemed like it was a principled stand rather than a, uh, a pragmatic stand, I would it does. argue. It does. And I wonder if part of his problem is he does as he's told, and when it gets too far, he, he kind of gets upset and <laughs> threatens his resignation. I, I think that's true. And I, one, one thinks that this was not the first run-in, the first frictions that between Montgomery and O'Connor. I, I, I think a lot of the things that were happening around Khan, uh, O'Connor was overruled in – uh, what he wanted to do and how he wanted to execute things. And this was probably a culmination of a relationship in, in some stress. That's right. He was trying to put troops on some of the armor, wasn't he? And he was refused. Right. This was a, another innovation O'Connor was trying to exploit and in basically creating a mechanized force by putting infantry on, on top of tanks and be constantly overruled. It, you know, it was not policy. It wasn't... Uh, <laughs> And uh, that definitely caused some bad feelings. Which is interesting because he'd obviously, I can't remember, I'm not completely sure which of the operations it was, but he clearly had learned that he needed to have closer, that was Goodwood. So it was Epsom, after Epsom, Goodwood, uh, he was wanting to put the infantry on and Dempsey, who was second army commander, blocked him. And he was obviously aware that, like the Germans, you needed to get that infantry in close. Although Pitt Roberts did complain at some point again, he didn't always uh, grasp combined operations as well as he might, though he got better. Exactly. And, and Roberts viewed things from his level and who knows what O'Connor was trying to do that he wasn't allowed. And O'Connor wasn't the type of man that would uh, badmouth his superiors to his subordinates saying, I would love to do this, but it's simply, no, these are the orders. Yeah, I agree. He's clearly, you know, he's, he's a you know, principal guy who, who, does as you does it as you are, should be doing as a soldier. Do as you do as you're told. You take your orders. Being removed to India upset him. 
and in, which he's only been there 30 hours, he writes to, to his wife how depressingly awful his job was. Yeah, it was a big command. It was an important command. It was the key command in India. They, they were very happy to have him. Just he didn't enjoy, he didn't enjoy it. It was very much more administrative. Uh, and that's how he saw out the war in India. I mean, his war years, why do you think he was overlooked for his, for, for, for his time? Well, there were political considerations. Montgomery was the brightest star, star in the sky and was not above uh, ignoring, it, it, at best, uh, <laughs> everybody else. For whatever reason, Churchill never championed O'Connor like he did other successful generals. That, is, to me, is one of the great inexplicable points. As, as, as much as uh, Churchill could be a thorn in the side of his commanders from afar, he, he also tended to you know, be their loudest champions. And it wasn't that he ever disparaged O'Connor, he just never seemed to mention him very often. And th- that could well be perhaps some defense of his own policies uh, with the Greek fiasco. Maybe it was just a, a period he didn't want to dwell on. And certainly the, the what ifs of if uh, you know, O'Connor had been unleashed on Tripoli maybe that was just something he didn't want to uh, dwell on. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I find it almost inexplicable why. You know, at the time of Compass, you know, the Battle of Britain's raging, Britain standing alone, it was one operation, albeit highly successful, but then it's completely overshadowed by the absolutely debacle in Greece. And then, again, you, you, you've got Rom- Rommel punching straight back. And then... I also wonder if, again, we mentioned before, Montgomery's very quick out with his his recollections of the war, which paper over everything and make it all Montgomery's war, which, again, you, you, he writes people out. Uh, and Churchill was very quick out with his. And as you mentioned, if Churchill's... It, it, a lot of what is written about the war is, is still um, framed in, in how... Churchill represented the war. It was very much Churchill's war rather than necessarily an actual version of, of, of the war. So that might be another reason why it's penciled out. Well, o- O'Connor never wrote a biography. He never wrote his recollections. Wavell, Auchin, like all, all these other voices that had insight were for various reasons, but I think largely because they just weren't interested in that sort of political a claim or being in, in some sort of a, a dust up with either Churchill or Montgomery it just didn't interest them to do so. And it, to, to all our loss, because I think you're right, the, the two that were most motivated to get there uh, the fastest set the tone and there was never really a comprehensive alternative to that put forward. The other big question is, is he unfairly judged at Normandy? In my opinion, yes. I think if you look at the numbers at the details it really comes back to what we talked about before was who did any better (laughs) the answer is really no one so how harshly can you want to judge o'connor for his performance and particularly given the ultimate success that that he did uh, manage to contribute to uh i I thought that's unfair i mean he was put in a very difficult position he was not in the position as he was in the desert where he had open flanks, he had, flanks, he had freedom of mo- freedom of uh, decision-making and movement. He was there with someone, you know, on either side of him. He had a very small operational uh, area to work in, very little control of how he could do things. So he gets very much more into only being able to do limited, you know, forward, forward assaults, which is not what his name, it made his name within the desert. I think you could look at it from a different perspective and say he was a man that was in an Italian prison for two and a half years missed out on all of the lessons learned in uh, North Africa and elsewhere had to come back and get caught up very quickly uh, I mean just the physical toll toll that that would take on you must have been tremendous be put into this position of huge responsibility with troops and officers that were probably unknown to him or at least he never worked with before dropped into the biggest battle uh, or the biggest campaign of the war for, for for Britain and to have performed as well as he did seems astonishing to me. Finally, I think the other, the, the, there's the ultimate what if. I mean, would he have done any better in the desert against Rommel? I would like to, to think yes. I think he understood maneuver warfare in a way that, you know, Auchinleck I think was 
harshly judged and unfairly in a lot of cases and the political pressure he was put under to constantly attack before preparations were were made was substantial but uh, Lech, i think i agree with you there you would have to think o'connor would be under the same sort of the pressures but i don't know if he's the type of man that would stand for it i, I don't think he's the montgomery type that would uh <laughs> just through pomp and uh force of will uh, just do things the way he wanted to but i, I think in his own ways he would accepting some of the things that Auchinleck probably accepted. If if memory serves, Auchinleck followed Wavell, but Auchinleck somehow got took direct command of the troops in the field, didn't he? Yeah, it, it was his decision to, to step into that position after a... Which he's been crit- criticised for because that's not actually his job. It's true, but I, I think the alternatives were <laughs> not good. Well, I was going to say, w- w- which makes you wonder if he was doing his job and he had a commander in the field that he trusted who was think- thinking along similar lines because uh, Auchinleck didn't do too badly. Or within, we didn't do too disastrously. You know, uh, if he had a commander in the field such as O'Connor, whether that might actually have been quite a good pairing. I think it might have. Yeah, O'Connor seemed to be able to work with just about anyone. I mean, the the testimony to his friendship with Montgomery in itself is, (laughs) uh, he seemed a very personable person. uh, Would just find ways to get along with people. didn't have enemies, as far as I can tell. Uh, detractors occasionally, but they seem to have their self-interest. But he seemed to work well with, uh, aside from the <laughs> the way things ended in, in Europe, perhaps. But that seems to be a, an exception to the rule. He seemed to get get on well with anyone he was thrown together with. I, I think his big failure, ultimately, was not militarily. His failure was probably more his inability to deal with... Um, the larger political kind of ramifications or silly, silly internal politics, such as his dust up with Montgomery over Sylvester. There's something about his character that that was more of a problem ultimately than necessarily. He was a very good field commander. Uh, that's probably a fair judgment. Well, Mark, uh, we've covered a lot of ground there. Thank you. Don't forget, if you like the show, you can join the conversation on Facebook. And have a look at the website, www.podcast.com, where you will find World War II related information that I discover and find interesting. I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening.